All right, so we are recording now. Um, just so everybody is good. I, for everybody that doesn't know who I am, I'm um, Dr. Jeff Williams. I am the department chair for the exercise sports science program for all of Kaiser. I know that there's some guests on here. I know I got my faculty on here, so this is awesome. Um, we try to do, we've been trying to, Stefan, we've been trying to do this, what, at least twice a year if we can with yes. different, you know, different areas, which is awesome because the last time we did it was diverse. It was Yes, supplementation, uh, nutrition, and then we had um, kind of like return. To Chris, Chris Swagger from the. Right. So we're, you know, we're always trying to bring in new things and try to include our students and as well with everything. So it really is this is, and it's fun because we get to take, you know, people in our community as well and, you know, showcase them. And I throw this stuff up on my YouTube page. Stefan puts all this stuff up on his Instagram page. So we get, you know, we like seeing all that. So um thank you to our guests that are going to be joining us stefan i'm going to have you uh i'll have you introduce everybody when we're good so sit back uh save your questions unless there's something like pressing just press that little raise hand button and we'll get you going but for the most part yes you know write down your questions as you're going and then we'll try to see if we can stump them at the end so <laughs> yes. let's go <laughs> very good so uh, first, uh, we want to say thank you to Kaiser to let this happen, uh, Jeff, the UDC, and also, if you guys don't know, he runs, he's a program coordinator for a master's degree online that we offer now, and then uh, my program director, Professor German, just joined us, so thank you for everybody, all the program chairs, all the staff across the whole state, and then our guest speakers, of course. To start, we're going to... I want to introduce our friend, colleague for several years, Tim Crowley, has been the head strength and conditioning coach at Mont Verde Academy since 2012, overseeing the training of varsity sports academics. He has more than 30 teams that he supervised. His teams have won 14 national championships, multiple teams, individual honors. Crowley also works as a consultant. He has his own company, TC2 Coaching, where he coaches endurance athletes, I uh, have won professional and national championships and world championships. He's an Olympic triathlon coach and has won USA Triathlon's National Coach of the Year and Development Coach of the Year awards. So Crowley is a frequent present in national conference clinics, author of books and co-authors in some books, my book included. So team, thank you. And then let's start it. All right. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedules today. And I'm really excited about this topic today because typically I'll always be speaking on X's and O's, exercise science, physiology, training, conditioning. But what I really want to do today is give something a little bit different and give you the behind the scenes or the other things that you're going to, as a, as a student, you know, coming in with sports science or a sports science related program, things that you're going to need to know as you get in the, in the field and, you know, start your career. Things that probably I wish I knew at that point that I've learned a lot of things the hard way and things that I work with my staff or the interns that I work with. Um, so we're going to get started here and uh, make sure I really keep, you know, keep a close watch on the clock so we don't go over because sometimes we get involved with this. I get get really excited about this and um, we could go for hours, but um, I'll make sure we keep it on on schedule. And really this really talk really kind of emerged from when the uh, the students came to Montverde Academy in February. It was a February, I believe. Um, and so we want to kind of build upon that. So. Oh, all right. Why is my it's not the slide is not moving. Let's see. We get click that? On the there we go. OK, we got it. We got oh, yeah. it. OK. All right, so Professor Diaz already went through. I'm not going to bore you with this. If you really, really want to learn more about my bio, please feel free. You can go look me up online, and I'm not going to waste our time doing that because I really want to get into what we want to talk about today. The first thing I want to talk about is, you know, broadening your perspective of, of the profession. Typically, I think when we, you know, we're in school, we just need to learn about sets and reps and anatomy and physiology and think once we get done, that's going to be all we're going to need. There's a lot of other things that you're going to need to bring that out once you go out uh, into the field. So I'm going to give you some tips that hopefully will set you up for success. Uh, we're going to look at communication skills in today's world. And again, the last 10, 15 years, that has changed dramatically. 
Then we're going to talk a little bit about continuing education. So we get your formal education that you're in school. We're going to look at continuing education and all its different types. And then at the, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about some of the emerging fields in sport performance. So with communication skills, and really what we're looking at is connecting with people. When you're going to be out in the field, whether you're a personal trainer, a strength coach, an athletic trainer, or any other, you know, in the health and science fields, you're going to be working with people and your ability to communicate your ideas, what you're doing to other people is going to be critical to your success, the program's success, and the people around you. So we're going to look make sure we're using the correct tools. And, and this comes not only from, from working as a strength coach, but also working as a uh, endurance or triathlon coach when I'm working with um, the different people I'm working with is oftentimes, you know, some people only have, you know, text messages. Or they'll do everything in text. You get a whole paragraph. So learning how to when to use a phone, when to use text messages, when to to see people in person. Those are all super important. Collaboration is another really important thing. I found as I develop more in my career, I really love the collaboration side of it. Um, everything from all it again, all these different communication skills are ways we're going to communicate. You know, I love you know Professor Diaz a couple of years ago asked me to you know to write a section for his book. Um, I love that. I've contributed to several different books. We're collaborating every day, working with coaches, athletic trainers, and teams, and that's really interesting. Um, when you can do that is you realize that the sum is greater than the individual parts. You're going to develop a toolbox with your communication, working with coaches, working with parents, working with kids, working with administrators. They all require different skills. A lot of these you can learn, but a lot of them you're going to learn by doing. Um, so it's really important that you're really comfortable with all the entities or all the different type of people that you may be working with. The ones that you're working with might be slightly different than this list. I'm using what, what I tend to deal with um, and how we approach that because each one's going to be a different approach. Social media is another really big one uh, in terms of looking at, you know, the type of social media you're on. How are you using social media as a tool? The one thing, and I'll say this a little bit later too, but I want to make sure I say it now, is that be careful with your social media, what you put, what you do on there, because people are always looking. Um, you know, future employers are going to be looking. When you go for an interview, they're going to check your social media. Um, so make sure you're careful about what you have on there um, and, and what you, you know, what you're displaying. And then again, always maintain uh, your integrity. OK, do the right things for the right reasons. I think that's important because as a as a trainer, as a coach, you're going to be out there and, and your integrity, what you bring to the table is going to be the most important thing. OK, um, you know, as a quote here, I, I love this because I've seen this in many different places. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. You need to care about what you're doing. It's not about you. It's about the people that you're that you're working for and working with. When we talk about the communication, talk about our art, you know, writing things that you can do and start now to start to write because the idea is getting your ideas out there into into the world. Uh, you might be working and have say, I got these great ideas, but if no one knows about it, you're not going to affect any change. It's also a way to separate yourself from others in the field. And some of the easy ways you can do that: writing articles. This used to be a lot more difficult when it was only like magazines and in print form. But now since there's there's websites and, and all kinds of places that you can post your articles, get involved in writing. And, and a nice thing about writing is that it's taking an idea and you're putting it into some sort of a format. OK, so it's a really good skill to learn and it's a really good way to advance your career. OK, instead of articles, you can set up your blog sites. I don't even know if they still use. I know I still have them, but the idea is just putting a blog site where you can start putting your own material. And the nice thing I think that differentiates a blog site from, uh, say, writing an article, it doesn't have to be super long. So you can start to create ideas, folders, files on different topics and start putting them out there. And then you can just publish them out there. It's a way that people start to recognize what you're doing and what you're seeing. And all of these different ways of doing this are all inter interrelated. And I'll kind of relate to that in, in a little bit. Another really cool one, if you if you like combining video with uh, with written you know written work, is CoachTube. I use CoachTube to produce my online um, books because I like the idea. As a coach, I can't do everything in writing, so we'll use uh, strength training as a good example. If you write strength training you, to have diagrams, you need oftentimes video to be able to portray that. And really, as soon as like. Five or ten years ago, you'd buy a book and then come with either an accompanying DVD or 
uh, you'd have to go with a special code and go on to, to Vimeo or, or some other place where we would unlock it. But now it can be embedded in there. And I love this format. And, and if you're not familiar with it, I, I definitely, you know, I'd urge you to check it out because I've got topics on everything. And the nice thing is you can publish it for you can publish your own material for free. Um, I love using it because it allows me to publish stuff and do it in a way that I can keep it at a very low cost. Um, there's all kinds of stuff on there. You can have quizzes on there. You can use it for CEU stuff. So it's a really good, good site. I don't think a lot of people are aware of it, but it's getting larger and larger. Um, you know, co contribute to books, contribute, you know, whether it's a chapter, it's a section. That's another really good way to build your resume and get you out there um, in writing and contributing. Speaking. Um, you know, a lot of ways, to, again, this is a real easy way to get involved. And again, it's the same thing with writing, but be able to put your ideas verbally, I think is hugely important in this in this field. Um, and whether you're a, a personal trainer, uh, a strength coach, PE teacher, athletic trainer, any of these fields, you are presenting on a daily basis, whether you know it or not. It might be one on one. It might be in a small group. It might be to a team, but you're going to do that. So developing your verbal skills, I think, is hugely important um, as a good skill to develop. Now, there's all kinds of conferences and a lot of times you can volunteer, you know, you can go and speak at a conference and, you know, and sometimes you have to start with really small ones. It could be regional ones. And then if you do well, they'll invite you to, you know, a national conference. But the other really thing which all this you know, builds in is obviously it's great to go out and speak on topics that you feel comfortable with and really develop your um, you know your resume as a as a speaker. But what also does when you go and speak at a conference, they will often you know if it's you have to travel, they'll pay for your expenses, they'll pay for your hotel, they'll allow you to to go to the conference. So it's a really easy way also to meet other people, learn new material, and develop CEUs all in a very cost efficient way. There's a lot of virtual opportunities to speak. Um, you know, this is one for me. I always look for the opportunities to get in front of people to try to teach because I really enjoy that. Um, and I think after, you know, 30 plus years of being in the field, I've, I've made a lot of mistakes. I've learned a lot of stuff. And so the idea is to try to advance the career, make things better than you found it and go and, and, and do that. And the, I found that the more that I do this, the more comfortable I get doing it. And then you try to expand your, you know, your, your, base of your you know topics and knowledge base to speak on other things. There's always in-house opportunities as well. You know, and that means within school, within your organization, to be able to speak uh, and do different things to present. We'll do a lot at, you know, I do it at our professional development, um, you know, professional development meetings. Um, we do it with teams. And so to really to get yourself in front of people to help teach people is a really, really valuable thing. Um, one other thing, new thing, if, if, if you're not on this, is something I, I joined last May when it very first began, but it's called Any Question. And I you know, got on as a strength expert and have been having a lot of fun with that because it puts me in front of the, my phone or the camera on a very regular basis. So I'm getting feedback of my own videos and presenting and how you answer topics and stuff like that. But also it's a great opportunity to learn because they have a lot of different channels on there and it's, it's free and you can get on there and learn a lot of different things. So definitely worth checking that out. Go a little bit back to professional, uh, to social media. And, you know, I really want to dive a little bit into this is that, you know, your professional presence is your social media. So uh, you might think it's, ah, it's just my personal stuff, but people are going to check it. So you want to make sure you're very careful about what you're putting in there, making sure it's not offensive. Um, but you can also use it professionally to advance yourself in terms of um, what you're presenting, what you're putting out there. And it's a double edged sword. So you need to be careful of that, but you can make it work for you. Um, one of the things, for example, the way that I use Twitter is that the nice thing on Twitter, I can go look at, like, say, for example, uh, strength coaches that I respect. I'll go look at who are they following. And so I can find sports scientists, other people. So pretty much I use my entire Twitter solely to be able to get good, good information and get stuff quickly. So when you know new articles come out, new research comes out, you can always you know find that first. And so it's a really good way of using um, you know Twitter in that regard. OK, and again, employers will do their research when when interviewing people, they will often check HR, will often check, uh, you know, uh, people's social media, um, do a search just to make sure that they there's nothing there that's going to be problematic for the company if they're hiring you. OK, I want to dig a little bit now into professional development uh, or, or continuing education. I'm going to put into three different categories. It'll be kind of professional, in-house, what I, what I like to call independent study. Okay. Um, 
So in terms of formal, you know, formal continuing ed, this is the stuff that's like you know, broaden your certifications. If you've got certificate, you know, either adding certifications, um, and again, you don't need to have a ton of them, but make sure the ones that you do do are high level. You can then work within those if they've got multiple levels within those certifications. You can work towards getting the highest. Uh, I think that helps. And then doing some, you know, deep dives into some of the certifications, whether that's, you know, uh, advanced stuff, getting involved. That might be serving, might be serving on on committees, um, which I think is important because now you're working to change the landscape of those organizations and within your professional organization. So you're making change. Um, and then also you have opportunities there, you know, to present once you're in there and presenting at national, uh, you know, uh, conventions and conferences can be really good. It's really rewarding. And it's a really good way to to elevate yourself with, within your profession. If we're looking at in-house, so this would be uh, whether it's in a school, or, you know, an organization, wherever you're working, um, you know, teach and coach those around you. Um, I find one of the biggest things as they head strength and conditioning coach is continuing ed within our coaches because what I realize is like the athletic trainers and the strength coaches all have to maintain certifications, but oftentimes team sports and such do not. So it's our job to make sure we're educating our coaches so we're all on the same page. And that can be stuff with small groups, that's professional development. Um, but it's also good that we're doing that to learn not only teaching them, but also learning ourselves. So we work also closely with our coaches. So we're learning more about sports that we may not have you know, a high level of expertise in so that we can better serve our, our athletes in our in our program. Well, some of the stuff that we've developed at Montverde is a coach's library. So we basically have library where we have all kinds of, it could be coaching books, but non-coaching books as well, just stuff to make them better. So we have those where coaches or, or anyone in the athletic department can check them out, but it puts us all on the same page. And what I've really learned is if I've got three or four people that have read similar books that I have, our conversations now are, are much different and way better and more productive. Um, we also provide weekly continuing ed articles. This is part of our ongoing continuing ed on our teams, um, our coaching channel. And so what I'll do is this goes into, we'll talk a little about sport performance stuff, but basically it's teaching them the things that we want to be doing and how do we get better uh, in a lot of the areas that in sport performance that we want to. And then we have professional development days where we have meetings and stuff. And there's always an opportunity to get in front of our coaches to educate on a particular topic. And so, again, so we're trying to make a high tide floats all ships. We're trying to bring everybody along for that, that ride. And then my, my, maybe my favorite one is I call it independent study. Um, and these are, are deep dives and be becoming an expert on a topic. And I think we all wanna be pretty good and we all need to know a lot of things about a lot of different things, very broad. But what separates you from other people is doing a deep dive and becoming an expert on a particular area. Okay. Um, and one of the things is, you know, the quote here is like, you know, I just, I, I saw this recently, so I gotta add this to the PowerPoint is, you know, I've known no wise people who didn't read all the time, zero and, and the interesting thing is most people once they're done with formal education never ever pick up a book um and so really if you want to be really good and the, the kind of the, the kind of the going thing here is like they said if you read about an hour a day after a year you'll be in the top five percent of your field because people just don't do it so really become a reader um, and, and I'm a big fan of, of books and, and developing your library because I go to my library all the time when I'm developing programs, when I'm doing research for talks and articles and such. So I really love the, my library and digging into that. And really this idea came to me, I was reading a book um, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, it was about the New England Patriots and, and, and Bill Belichick used to do this with his, his young coaches. He would give them an assignment at the beginning of the year. And it might be like a, a defensive scheme or something and said, your job this year is to become an expert and learn every single thing you can about this one particular topic. And they would do it and they would come back and present that to the other coaches. But by the time they finished this project, they were the guy in the NFL on this particular topic. So if you start to do that, you really start to separate yourself. And I found it's become really fun. And I pretty much take a topic every year do a deep dive. It starts early in the in, in, in the fall and I start reading everything I can on it. And then I start to create ideas. And then at the end, which is kind of where I am this right now, when you talk about the end of the school year, as I go into my summer break, I start to write and develop it. And so some of the topics that I've done, this is strength training for endurance athletes, sleep, um, high performance aging, 
And now this year I'm working on the foot and the ankle. So I find topics that I've discovered that I really want to get into, learn as much as I can about it, then do some writing and then produce something where it, it can then hand to other people, whether it's a, a program or really a package type thing. And, and this is this system has really helped me develop in terms of developing deep dives into particular skills as opposed to just really kind of broad knowledge. Um, and so we talk about, you know, back to readings, like one of the things, if you read 10 page, you know, most books are somewhere in the 260 to 300 pages. So if you just do nothing more than read 10 pages a day, which doesn't take long, you're going to read one book a month. And then what's going to happen is over the course of a year, that's 12 books over the course of several. So now you really start to add that up. And this has to be not just what you have for school. So discipline yourself to do some reading outside of what your requirements are for school. And it won't take long, but it really will. It will change your, you know, I'll say it'll change your career, but it probably will change your life as well. All right. OK, what I want to dig into now is a little bit about sport performance. And I'll tell you, I'll qualify. We call it sport performance. And this kind of came to me uh, a few years ago where, you know, we're talking about X's and O's in terms of training. We've got exercises and everything we're doing. But what's the next level? And so we really started to dig in is like the things that are going to amplify our athletes, both in terms of health and performance. And we started getting into this. I also realized this works outside of sport as well. This is stuff for everyday people. Um, so what it is, is, you know, become valuable and dispensable. You create value for yourself when you start to dig into this. So some of these areas that we really start to work with, and again, you can look at these and you may have a particular interest and go, oh, this is something I really like or really into. And again, this is just a small list. It can, you know, expand broadly. Some of the topics are like sleep, and this has become a really big focus for me. This is one of my deep dives a few years ago um, because athletes which weren't getting enough sleep, and I realized that that impacts their, you know, physically. When I realized that that sleep or lack of sleep, in fact, affects your athletic development, your academic you know, development, and your mental health, then it became a massive issue. And then this is something we continue to work on, working with teams, and again, it really comes down to implementation. I can hand someone a hand down information. That is fine. The trick is how do we take this information and implement it to have an, an effect and an outcome um, you know, on our athletes? And, and actually, I, I was just, you know, I have been working on how do we get this across to our athletes, the people we work with. And literally yesterday I was watching uh, a video from a conference last week and it was a, a talk on sleep, and and the presenter said one of the things that he did when he was uh, at one of the, the colleges he worked with, he took their sleep hygiene or the things that they wanted to, you know, you know, darkness, noise, light, all these things, and they printed them on a pillow, pillowcase, and they presented it to their athletes. And it was such a simple, simple thing, and the light bulb went off. I'm like, that's it. That's exactly the thing I've been missing. So I wrote it down. And that is going to be my new project going forward. Um, so it's a continual learning process that we we're like, I was like 95% there. There's this 5% I couldn't figure out. How do we get this in, you know, across? I'll have to come back and report back how well this works out, but I think it could be a really good thing. Other areas of, you know, a lot of people in interest in nutrition. Okay. And so again, we talk about sports nutrition for high school athletes. It all comes down to implementation. How we get it across, how are we going to get it where we actually improve, you know, their 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 you know dietary food choices and some of this is interesting because it isn't always like really difficult stuff what we found is that it's as easy as you get a team say how many ate breakfast this morning and you may get two-thirds or half the kids put their hands up so it isn't really high level stuff it's really the foundation of the basic stuff that we have to address before we can get into the more quote-unquote fun stuff or more or, you know difficult stuff we want to deal with Another big area of mental skills, focus, you know, focus, distractions, presence. This is a huge thing because kids are always on their phone. They're always being distracted and pulled in many different areas. We can get them to focus um, both in terms of athletically and academically. We're going to see a good effect. And again, it's going to amplify the training that we're doing. We've delved into stuff like breathing and its, you know, and its effect on the, you know, sympathetic and parasympathetic systems and looking at heart rate variability. These are all, you know, effective stuff. Another area we've really, you know, we looked at is routines and habits. And this is one I really like because this is kind of an overarching thing. And again, the things that you can use in your own life and figure out that you can bring across. But, you know, everything we do in the course of our day, we all have habits, we all have routines. Some are good, some are not so good. By addressing and working on these different areas, we can then start to 
change the way we're doing things, change the way we're training, and change the way that you know we're affecting our athletes and ourselves. So the nice thing is all these things that we're talking about, you first want to start to learn and then practice on yourself. I always say I'm the first guinea pig. So when I learn new things, I'm the first person that I experiment on. Um, and you know, experiment of one, once you start to get some ideas, you can start to work on that with your athletes or the people that you work with. But I definitely don't experiment on, on those people. Uh, first, make sure you figure it out for yourself um, in the first. Quick summary, look at that. I might actually get to, I'm gonna be on time. This is good for me. Um, so one thing is develop your path. One thing is that when I graduate, I graduated college in Springfield College in 1988. The two things that I do now as a, as a strength coach and triathlon coach did not exist then. Okay, so 30 plus years ago, they were not a thing. So what you may end up doing, what your ultimate profession, goal, drive is, may not even exist at this point. Okay, be humble and be hungry. Always, I think your energy level, your drive is really what's going to carry you uh, in whatever field that, or endeavor that you're in. So you always want to, and again, this is where the, the sport performance and the sleep and all that, because day in and day out, you want to be performing at your best. Okay, always have integrity, do the right things for the right reasons. Um, make your workplace or any place you are, make, you know, make your workplace in the field better than you found it. So make sure no matter whenever you're at a position or you move to another position, it's better than when you got there, which means you made a difference. And the thing is, and I have this written on my marker board in my office every day is make a difference in someone's life today. So it, it doesn't have to be something profound. It could be something simple. It just might be like we try to make it a habit that we're making a connection or talking with every single athlete that comes into our facility on a daily basis. This isn't always easy because we may have up to 200, 250 kids per day, but just be like, hey, how are you doing today? Hey, that, that exercise looked really good. It's a simple thing. And sometimes you don't realize they may have had a crappy day. And just because you said something, you made it made a difference. Um, I would include this, this picture here is that, you know, talk about what we deal with every day. And so this is a couple of years ago, uh, just coming out of COVID, but this is our tallest athlete, uh, Jalen Duran, who now actually plays for the uh, the Detroit Pistons and one of our tennis players. So we have a really diverse group. And I came across this picture, wanted to toss it in there because everyone, you know, there's a wide range that we work with. It's not all high level athletes and beginners that we come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, and again, I want to thank, you know, Kaiser. Uh, this is, I think there's a couple, this one, this, I don't think this was, no, this was an issue. It was a couple of years ago with our, you know, I love when we have our field trips every year. Uh, my staff looks forward to this. We love getting involved every year. We're trying to make it a little bit better for the athletes that came out, but we enjoy the, you know, it's a change for us. And we like to, to share with what we're doing, um, you know, to the students that come out and obviously uh, to all the teams that we work with, because this is our laboratory. We're learning every day from them, the things that we're doing. And again, I wouldn't be able to do the speaking without my great staff here, Brandon and Kate. Um, they're, you know, first year, uh, they're with me and we've had an absolutely fantastic year. They add a lot to the to our program and, uh, you know, it allows me the, the ability to get better and also allows me the opportunity to, you know, to share this information um, with you all. So, so thank you for having me today and hopefully you learned a few things and, you know, again, we'll have some questions later, but you can always contact me for anything additional. Yes, yes. How did you do on time? Good. Yes, oh, right on time. Right on time, uh, good. Thank you so much, uh, guys. Uh, save your questions, okay, to the end. Just real quick, uh, very important what Tim said about reading every day. This is, needs to become a habit. Our students sometimes don't even want to read the stuff for the class. Imagine, he's talking about do your normal stuff for the class and then separate a little bit of time to study something. So follow like somebody on Twitter or Instagram. See what they're researching and then, okay, now there's a new research and then try to pull those articles and then go for it. Another thing, very important that he mentioned also, try to get the opportunity, you know, so see, Kaiser, we put this opportunity, we try to open this network. When we do those few trips, it's not just for you to go there, it's for you to open your network, see other places, open your mind. And then another thing very important that he said, try yourself first. So if you learn something, what do you need to do? Apply it to yourself, see how your body responds. Then you start understanding all the science, the physiology behind, and then you go from there. Very nice, Gene. So now we're going to have our second guest. This is also a friend of mine from Brazil, from the same city, Guilherme Ferreira. Guilherme is uh, from Brazil. He studied in Russia. He followed me in Russia. Uh, he finished his master's degree in 2011. After that, he moved to America. He, he's a head swim coach of Mont Verde Academy. He worked 
with uh, athletes, swimmers that participate in the Olympic Games in London, Rio, Tokyo, among many other international competitions. His swimmers won medals in the World Championship, Pan American Games, national championships in 12 different countries. His injury studying relationship between training and recovery. He's a father <laughs> and then he's a very good guy. So let me, please, if you can share your screen, I think, uh, uh, Tim, you need to stop sharing your first. Yep. Got it. And then Guilherme will be able to. to All right. It. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Diaz, for the invitation. Thank you, Tim. It was very interesting. Uh, let me try here to share. And then, how does it work? I'll probably just share my screen and then I'm going to go for a window. Let's see here. Oh, here we go. I guess we can go right for the PowerPoint, right? So tell me if it works. Let's see. Yep. We are and for me, it's still, up. For, up for me it's still loading. Did it appear? Yep. All right, nice. So, well, thank you again for, for the opportunity. It's always great. Like Tim said, uh, it's interesting that my, the beginning of my presentation is very similar to, to what Tim show uh we didn't combine this we work together uh mm -hmm. team takes care of of the swimming and the strength training for our swim team and uh one of the things that's is great to 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 connect with other professionals just like he said uh and is a is an honor to be to work together with him well i'm gonna just i put here dr Diaz already did a little presentation but i'm gonna go anyway can you see the did it move the the slides yeah. just to make sure yeah. okay good so well, I graduated from the university, like Federal University of Paraná in Brazil, uh, Bachelor of Physical Education. I did a master's degree in Russia, so I follow I follow Dr. Diaz there. Uh, I worked with swimmers for already about 20 years. I was a swimmer myself and then started working. Uh, I worked really literally from babies to, to Olympians, all, all ages I passed through already. Right now here at Montverde Academy, we work with Hands-on, I work with 15 to 18, basically some younger kids. Uh, but we have, we call 8 to 18, right? Where our team is starts from, from the lower school, so 6-year-old, 7-year-old, all the way until they go to college. Um, so I'm almost Dr. Diaz's younger brother. So everything he did, I follow him. <laughs> and they even finish here in the same city. So basically, what is it? long-term long-term athlete development right what is it basically i put these three pictures here to illustrate this is um how we're gonna take those little guys on the left side uh seven eight year old to become successful teenager athletes right 15 year old in the middle picture in the top and then maybe one day to become full-grown athletes, NCAA champions, just like he's showing on the picture here, Olympic champion, right, Caleb Dresser here and there in the picture. How we're going to get this process done? Like, what kind of training we have to give to the kids when they are eight-year-old there on the left picture, that they will be good when they're 15? And what kind of training we have to give them when they are around 14, 15, 16, that will make them successful when they go to college? So basically, that's the answer is we try to to, to find the that that's the, the the answer to the question we try to find right what kind of practice how can, have to be the work of the little kids on the left for them to one day be the big guys on the right for sure it's not the same right we cannot give the same practice for the for the big guys. On the right for the NCAA champs, 20 year old, 25 year old, to the eight year old, and to the 14. So that comes the next part here. Where where we're gonna find this this information? That's the part that is similar to Tim. We didn't combine, but I just just like Tim, I think we have to read the classics. I put just a few few classics, a few books that I think are really important. Number one, probably is the most important that is available here and show here I'm not lying that I don't that I don't read really, I have it here actually uh it's a very interesting book there is a lot of 
about this in the Russian literature, the Russian specialized literature, but I don't think there is much translated to English. Maybe Dr. Diaz can uh, can can give a his perspective. Yeah, I, did, I read, never really searched for it, but I know that in Russian there is a lot. In English, for sure, this book here, the one that I put the picture, Long Term Author Development, that's for sure a very good one, very good start. And then I put this other two here that can give some good examples of exercises. There's Bompa and Vera Gambetta, Tim's friend. Uh, so they, they, they do also great work on giving what kind of exercising more, let's say more on the specific part. And what I found very useful for me, right? I work with swimming. So I found very useful to look, number one, to the classic, to the East Von Ballet book or other Russian literature and the Federation manuals. So if you go to USA Swimming, British Swimming Federation, Canada Swimming Federation, Australian too, you can find a lot of work on how these phases of the long-term development should look like, right? How many hours, what kind of exercises the eight-year-olds should do? How many hours, what is the characteristic of the 10-year-old? So many federations, they have these models and for many of them, you can find it. You don't have to be even a member to find it. So if you go online, you can, you can use it. Oh, but coach, I'm working with, with fitness. I have nothing to do with swimming. I can guarantee you that if you go there, even on the swimming specific literature, you will find plenty of things that you can use in your in your practice in any in any area. Uh, for example, I attend the the clinic with with Bergen Beta, right? It's called Gain, and it's if you look, it looks all about um, all about track and field, all about basketball, right? That's what he worked before but everything is adaptable to swimming everything is adapted to to your reality so always searching for this for reading the classics that's going to give you a great foundation for when you are a professional and especially now that i think that most of the people here are in college right now especially at this time is the moment to like tim said read a lot because that really makes a huge difference later and it will really help you in the beginning of the career. Other places serve as an assistant to someone great. Uh, I was really lucky. I didn't choose. This is a picture of me a long time ago, right? With Coach Grady, that I was his assistant for, for many years. And he was really, really good. It was really great for me. Uh, he was a very generous person, also was a great coach. He just retired about a year ago. And being an assistant, I think, Ask the why, like why we're doing this. Listen to listen to the answer and, and understand why this person who is very successful already proven to be successful for 20, 30 years, why he choose or he or she choose to do that way. Right. Be loyal. Um, I remember about 15 years ago, um, the head coach of the team I was working, he said oh, the best characteristic of assistant coach is loyalty so that means follow the lead and apply and then evaluate and then maybe question together with your head coach hey why we did this way maybe the other way can work but always in the moment of the practice be loyal and follow and follow the instructions this is a great way to learn um and where else just like tim said chat with other coaches visit other programs connect with great people not only on your field but in, in in every different field like today if sometimes i have a question i call dr diaz hey what do you think about this and this do you have any suggestion and it always comes with interesting answers so it's great to make like they said make the network that's going to help you finding jobs that's going to help you be more successful this is a picture when i went to visit the Swedish national team was training here in Florida, in St. Petersburg. So I just sent an email. Hey, can I go visit? And the head coach sent a message. Hey, here's our schedule. Just come any day. And I went to visit and they were very generous. Answer every question. Basically, the guy didn't give practice. He just chatted with me the whole 
workout. So it's it was a great way to learn. Another thing that I really believe that always question what you're doing, right? Uh, so I put this here, the steering principle. So train, measure, right? I'm training technique, trying to get a technique better. Try to measure the technique got better, yes or not? Oh, not really. Still needs to get better. Adjust the work you're doing, train again. And this is a forever cycle, right? We'll always be doing this. Train, measure, adjust. If you do this, you will always be improving. No matter what, your practice will be improving. And uh, why improve? Why why do you care? You want to win everything? Yes, but not really exactly this, but you want to always give the best. You know, those families, they bring the kids here for 10, 15, 16 hours a week to be under our care. So it's a huge responsibility to really give the best practice, not only on the sport specific, but in the education side of it. So it's a huge responsibility. And I think this is the this should be our motivation to to always do a great work. Uh, so anyway, let's go to the, the long term athletic development, right? That's what we want to talk about. So the first part. Uh, so there are some phases, right? There is the active start. There is the fundamentals. There is the learn to train. There is the train to train, train to compete, and then at the end, train to win. And then at the very end, when you already stop your 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 athletic career, you're gonna go to be active for life. That's what it's called. This I took from this here. This these names I took from this book here. Uh, this phase, right? But you can find in other places with different names. But at the end of the day, the, the content is very similar. So active start. I'm putting here some examples of swimming, but the, the characteristics are the same for, for everybody, right? Active start before eight year old. Uh, it's better if it's even before six to, to do some activity. Uh, develop all the, all the brain functions. So you're gonna develop the coordination, social skills, right? Respect the rules, uh, some gross motor skills, Imagination. Uh, I think the most important is the next item that I put there. Build the confidence and self-esteem. Joy for being active. Uh, I give an example. Um, so you have a kid who doesn't know how to swim, right? Doesn't know how to float, but doesn't know how to even like make any kind of locomotion in the water. Once you teach, they become confident. They become comfortable in the water. So they, what they're gonna do next? Once they know how to float, they know how to move in the water, what's going to happen? You throw them in the pool, they're going to play in the pool the whole day. And they're going to be learning their motor skills. They will be learning coordination because they're playing. But the first part, you have to build the confidence. So teach that little thing that will build the confidence and will make them play with that sport. And then they're going to be active. They're going to be playing. Then they're going to develop the flexibility, they're going to develop the balance, they're going to reduce stress, and they're going to improve sleep, right? Who has little kids at home, you know that if they sleep well, everything else gets better, right? And being active help them sleeping well. So basically, that's a very important, uh, not for the sport only, but for the entire development of the, the infants, right? Before eight-year-old, so any, any age, uh, I can... Little example, my kids, my older kids, it's going to be, going to be five soon. And of course, he knows how to swim <laughs> because we're always around the pool. So that was something we teach right away. And uh, that's what we observe. They play in the water. They see the. Sometimes they come to the pool here. They see the swimmers train and they copy. They learn just by copying. So we don't even have to. But that first step is the confidence. So I think this is the most, in my opinion, in my practice, the most important is this, like teach the few skills that will make them confident and all the other ones will come just with the play. Then we go for fundamentals. And about six to eight year old girls, about seven to nine boys, right? The girls, they, they develop a little earlier than the boys. Uh, and the number one thing I put there, the number one item, Keep it fun. This is very, very important, right? You have to keep it fun. So this, I put a picture there of these kids are about seven, eight year old. You know, we did a 
Christmas picture. They, always having fun at practice, always having some game activity in practice, always teach with the game together. Uh, participation in different sports encourage, so you have to encourage the kids. Oh, I want to do this soccer uh, soccer season now. Go do it. Oh, I'm gonna do track and field here. I give an example of the school here that we have every kind of sport. So most kids they swim year round. You know, it's twice twice a week, three times a week in this age. And other days they do something else. And that's great. You have to encourage. Never say no. You have to swim every day because you have to. You want if you want to be good in swimming, you have to do it every day. Never do this. Never do this. Uh, this uh, attitude. Always diversify. So practice the first the fundamental skills for then later be able to do the correct. Right. This is the moment to improve the ABC. Right. Agility, balance, coordination. If you don't have the agility, how are you gonna dive and put your arms like this? Right. If you don't have the agility, how are you going to do a turn, a flip turn in swimming, right? Do a flip turn and push off with the correct position. You're not going to do it. So you first develop the agility, you do exercises that will develop it. So then later you can do the full sports action, right? Coordination, same thing. How are you going to take a breath in the right moment when you're swimming? If you don't even know where your arm is, right? You have to first develop the coordination. Hold the both arms in front. Only move one. Stop. Count one to four. Go the other one. And little by little develop the coordination. So then later, in the next step, which is learn to train, then you're going to be able to teach a little bit better the, the technique, right? So the learn to train is the next step. The kids will be about nine to 12. I put their fluctuates. It changes. Why? Because the onset of the growth spurt varies depending on the kids and also depending on if they're boys or girls, right? Girls are typically earlier. They have the growth spurt earlier. So sometimes you have a girl who got the growth spurt when she was 10. So maybe you're going to have to move her from this learn to train to the next level earlier. It's very important to keep an eye on this. And how can you keep an eye? One is just by the eye, right? You see that the kid's bigger. But sometimes you don't see it because you see them every day. So it's hard to see the change. So one suggestion is to measure the height every three months. So they're every three months growing. Let's say, I might be wrong. I'm not used to inches too much, right? Brazil, we use centimeters. So let's say you're growing half inch every three months. And then all of a sudden, that kid grow grew one and a half inch in three months. Oh, that's a growth spurt right there. So maybe it's a moment to move from the learn to train to the next level. But let's go first here about the learn to train and then we go for the next. So like we said before the growth spurt, still encourage participation in fun games in other sports, encourage them to have fun, right? I put here a picture that illustrates this. This is a really, we did a competition that, that was a really, you know, if you see all the four kids are happy and smiling. If you don't have this, something is wrong. If they are nine to 12 year old and they are like this, at practice, something is wrong. They have to be smiling like all the time, not only a little bit, all the time they have to be smiling. It's very important. Maybe it's the most important. If you don't have this, they're going to leave the sport soon. It's very important. Uh, the adaptions occur very fast on this age. It's a very fun age to work with. I work with this age for many years, many years, like hands on. Right now I don't do anymore, but it's a very interesting, very energetic, very demanding, but very interesting. Uh, here's the moment to prioritize technique and etiquette. What is etiquette? Like they have to know, for example, how to get their time. You have to teach them how to get the time. You have to teach them, oh, what is progressive effort? What is it? This is the moment to teach them. Later, it's going to be too late. This is the moment. 9 to 12. Oh, progressive effort is. Number one, repetition, you do easy. Number two, a little bit quicker. Number three, already hard. And then number four, as fast as you can. Teach them this, because later they're going to use it. Right Right now, it's more the teaching thing. Uh, or, for example, how to do certain exercises. 
This is the moment. They have to learn at this moment, 9 to 12, not later. Later is harder than. Um, it's an excellent window to learn the fundamental sports skills, right? What is really, so what is important for, for sports in general in the previous one? Agility, balance, coordination, good. For swimming, what is exactly very important? Oh, the flexibility is also very important. Oh, it's also very important coordination, the timing of the stroke. Oh, it's important to pull, not with the hand to the side, but it's important to pull pointing the fingers down, right? Keeping the elbow deeper than the shoulder, the hands deeper than the elbow. These little things you start teaching at this moment. Like skills, they're fundamental to the sport. Uh, already apply these skills in the competitive setting. This is a very important thing. Why? Because that, that's going to help the kids to become more disciplined, right? So, for example, you say, look, do you want to swim very fast? Yeah, we want. They say this, right? Ah, yeah, of course. We want. Yeah. So you have to do this way and this way. So that comes from your expertise, right? Your, your suggestion must turn it into a faster swing. So when they go, boom, they go faster. Oh, great. That's going to solidify. They're not going to forget. They're going to really learn this. So respect for the rules. Maybe some goal setting already. Oh, my time is now... 30 seconds. I will try to break 30. I will try to go 29 in the next competition. So what do I do to do this? Oh, let's get better on the start. Let's get better on this. Let's get better on that one. So they start understanding that it depends on, on their own effort, right? So let's go for the next level. This, this starts to become very different. Train to train, right? That's when the kids already are in the growth spurt. The growth spurt started. That's a great moment to do what? Build the engine, right? Build the muscles, build their aerobic capacity. Uh, how do you do that? You have to, number one, well, some things before, consolidate the refining the skills. Always, right? The technique and skills is like the is like the backyard. If you don't take care, soon it's gonna look like a mess. So you always have to keep keep track of it. Always work on this because if you don't. Soon you're gonna lose it because they're growing. Their body, uh, their body proportions are changing. So if you don't keep working always on the technique, always on the skills, they lose it. It becomes a mess. So it's a very important thing to work on on this age because they're growing. They were five one, and now all of a sudden, after one and a half year, they're six inches. So they're six feet high. So do you think the technique doesn't change? Of course it changed completely. So it's very important that we, we keep track on this. So they can they are able to maintain coordination for long periods of time, right? In this picture, I put all these boys are, no, the, the two on the left, they're 14, the two on the right, they're 13. So they compete together. And this was our really, they met on the States, very young kids. So that's a that's a good thing, right? They will, they will become better still. Um, here, some of the same crew here with other friends. So one point, understand the implication of relative age effect. What is it? Some kids have the growth spurt when they are 12. Some they have when they're 14. So imagine you have four friends. Three have the growth spurt when they're 13. So they grow very fast. So their performance also grows exponentially. And the third, the fourth friend, he's 14, but he looks like an 11 year old still. He didn't have the growth spurt. So his performance will stay behind. So, how you need to work with these guys? The guys who are there in the top, you need to maintain them motivated. Say, look, you still have to train well because they need to understand that you have to already bring them to the next level, basically, next level competition. When the guy that stayed behind, you have to explain him, look, you still didn't grow. You will grow. Right now, what you have to do is get better every day, a little bit better every day. When they get a growth spurt, they will have a big jump. So it's very important to keep keep a look on this. And when the kids stay behind on the on the growing, not on the sport performance, but on the growing, right? He's 13, but his chronological age is 13, but biological age, he's like an 11-year-old boy. This happens very often. They need to maintain the kid motivated, maintain the kid confidence that 
maintain him training often than normal. So when he gets a growth spurt, he will also have a big improvement on the performance, right? Um, make sure they're training well and not competing too much, but also not stay far away from competition because that inhibits right performance. So you need to find a good relationship. I find that once every four or five weeks is a good ratio of training and competition. So compete every five weeks, four weeks. Uh, teach the relationship between training and performance. They, at this age, they have to know if I train well, I will compete well. If I don't train well, I'm not going to compete well. Sometimes it's hard, right? Because they're growing. So even if they don't train well, even if they don't train, sometimes they get better. It's a little problem, but they need to understand this. It's time to teach them. Uh, so this is the moment for a big increase in the volume of low intensity exercises. So in swimming, right, aerobic priority. You're going to do a lot of volume. So before you were doing one hour, now we're going to double it. We're going to go for two hours and little by little increase even more. Okay, swimming is a sport that you train a lot compared to other sports. Uh, it doesn't have eccentric contractions or almost nothing of this. So you can train a lot more than volume than other sports. That's the nature of the sport. That's how it is. Uh, and maintaining the amount of other Right, you still train sprint, you still train other things, but the amount of aerobic will grow a lot. Another um, another part here. Next level, what is it? Train to compete. That's when we are ready after the growth spurt or at the end of it, right? 15 to 21, that's a huge window, right? So it's from high school to finishing college, basically. Uh, it varies individually. Usually the boys stay longer in the growth spurt. Usually the girls stay shorter. They finish earlier, right? Sometimes a 13 year old girl is already finished the growth spurt, will not grow anymore. Sometimes take a little longer, 15, 16. Um, so that's already the time for serious commitment and pursuit of a goal. I want to do this time because with this time, I'll go to nationals i'm gonna do this time because with this time i'm gonna go to the olympics right katie ledecky was olympic champion at the age 15. so do you think she was not training very hard here for sure she was right when she was 13 14 for sure she was training very well she was already a very high level athlete so then when she was here and trained to compete she was having great performance right and she was committed to, to a goal. Uh, teach how to train and compete under any circumstance. So sometimes in this age, after the growth spurt, they are tired of training, but still we're gonna compete. You don't do this with the little kids, right? You don't depress them in the, in the training that much. So they always compete fresh. With this age, it's already fine. You just have to explain them and they understand and they enjoy the process. Uh, year round specialty training. So, for example, I'm a distance swimmer, I'm a distance running runner, I'm gonna do the distance. I'm a sprinter, I'm gonna do the sprint. Uh, high performance at competition and training. So, before it was more like about increasing the volume, right? 13, like in, during the growth spurt. After, it's not about increasing the volume anymore, it's about increasing the quality. We're gonna kind of keep that volume. So, it's, that's a very important point. At this age here, on the on the during the growth spurt, you will increase the volume until basically the maximum amount they will always do, maybe a little bit less. And here you're gonna keep that volume, that amount of training, that many hours of training, and increase the quality. Um, one important consideration when working with this age: it's harder to build the engine after the end of the growth spurt. And that happens especially with girls, right? And in this moment that the strength training is crucial, it must be a really good, well done strength training. And then we have team for the rescue, right? For me here, I rely on team for doer, and he really does the work. I have this is a picture of one of our swimmers, like you can see. She, the, I'm gonna give her as an example because she came here in a young age. She was basically finishing the growth sport when she got here. She was 14 year old. Now she's 17. Um, 
And it happened, what happened in this moment? So you finish growing and you are improving your performance exponentially, right? You're getting better and better. Even if you don't train well, you get better anyway. Then when you finish the growing, it's very hard to get better. And sometimes you even get worse. Uh, and at this moment, I see with the experience that the, the strength training, especially for the girls at this age, with the boys will happen later, right? With the boys will happen probably when they're on the 18, 19, 20, probably 19, 20, when they stop really growing. How are you going to get better now? Get stronger or get more endurance or both. But or better technique. That's it. There's no other way. So all the growth in performance will depend on the training. And I see that the strength training here is crucial. Uh, endurance training, at least for swimming, and I, I believe in other sports, is, is similar. It's kind of easier, let's say. It's more simple, right? Just do more with the same speed or do the same with more speed. Not simple. Strength is a little more complicated. Um, so it's very important to dedicate time for the strength training. Then we have to train to win, right? That's the next step. We're not going to really talk about this much because basically this is the high level um, sports training, right? This is another topic I don't really want to, to go into. To be honest, it's very similar. Training to compete, training to win is basically very similar. It changes a lot more on the, on the mental side. Uh, this is basically when they're going to be in college, right? And it's going to be, this is the high level, very individualized training. Uh, I put Katie Ledeck here because a very interesting example. She appeared in the in the world stage when she was here, probably here still, right? And she came here, she won. Well, here was when she was 15. She won London Olympics. Here in Rio, she won probably like five gold medals. And right now she's here, right? She's a professional athlete trying to still keep winning probably the the best female swimmer in history right so it's a very interesting case if you like sports if you like swimming for sure is an interesting story to to look at um well this is my contact like i said before i'm very i'm a big fan of visiting and uh, and talking to people so i put my my email i put my own account i don't do like tim says i don't put much stuff there but we try the, the the team account we put a little bit more so if you want to connect to us there and you know we're always happy to to receive visits we did receive visits from from dr g's students already and we'll be happy to to receive more and to answer any question that you will have now all right nice you let me thank you well done just summarize real quick guys uh long-term athletic development is very well developed in russia remember 2002 when i first went from a master's they had in the bookstore a little booklet for every single sport, just soccer, for example. What you should do when you have eight years old, the amount of run, the amount of the sprinting times, the amount of dribbles, the percentage of kicks, and then 10 years old, 12 years old, and then they go in brackets like every two years for every single sport. They had those, those manuals, you know, they start creating norms. Here in America, started to develop this. I see in baseball now, they're doing very, very strong push on that end and some sports. But see, so that's definitely important. And one thing he mentioned, if you have kids or you work with kids, to talk to the parents because the parents, when they bring their kids, they want the results immediately. And then see, when you talk a long-term development, you don't want to do that because if no, they lose the fun, like you said, when they're still little kids and you definitely want to make sure they enjoy and then focus on the technique side of guys. Sometimes you see athletes here focus too much on the strength training part, not on the technique aspect. And then later when they should do this towards the end of the preparation. But we open for questions at the end. So now without losing more time, we have the, our last speaker, Brantley Hawkins, is a colleague of us, uh, founder and owner of New Dimensions Wellness Club. Is a premier health and performance club here in Orlando area. They're our partners, colleagues. We send students there every week. We visit them. They do a an awesome job, guys. Very important. He has published several publications. He created a system combining aspects of health, fitness, wellness, working from youth, elderly to professional athletes. Uh, Brentley, please. 
Thank you, Coach. I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate you guys listening to me this morning and allow me to join you all. I know I was a few minutes late to the party and I unfortunately have to jump off again here. But I uh, had to give my two cents. I don't have any fancy presentations. This was a bit late. So I just want to be able to tell you guys my story. I have a video that I can show you this style of training. Uh, but really what I take a look at, and I guess first my background, uh, sports medicine degree. So really took a look at zooming into the body, understanding aches and pains and injuries, uh, learning how to evaluate certain injuries as well as uh, preventing them. And then went and got my master's degree over at UCF in applied exercise physiology. As I, I saw a lot of the injuries in general, I believe that they could be prevented with the right style of exercise uh, or just good exercise in general and programming, which is a lot of why we all do what we do. And uh, when I was at UCF, I was noticing our first year with the rowers. I worked with the men's soccer team and the women's rowing team. We had 32 cases of low back pain uh, in our rowers. A lot of them were missing time. They weren't being able to train. And so my second year coming in with them, I had spoke with a coach and I said, hey, I'd really like to take a look more into the movement aspect of this sport. Uh, we're, we're finding a lot of the same injuries are happening. And I'd like to revamp the way we train a bit as well as the way we warm up. Are you open to this? And great relationship with the coach. And she allowed me to make a few changes, I adjusted a couple of things. I worked more closely with the strength and conditioning department and uh, we went from 32 cases down to two and it was tremendous um, and now the girls were being able to train on a consistent basis that much harder in their sport and a lot of what we started taking a look at was a bit more integrated movements that involved rotation so taking a look at the rowers it's not our typical row where you're just in the sagittal plane but they actually have a transverse plane uh, where they have a little bit of rotation in that thoracic spine. <clears throat> it is all one-sided, so being able to balance back out the body was extremely difficult. So if you think about your baseball players, your golfers, uh, any sports where you tend to be more one-sided, even as you get into jujitsu, uh, even though you're supposed to be, you know, being able to pass guard and I'm no jujitsu guy, so please excuse me, but uh, you need to be balanced throughout the whole body. So that's when I really started diving in and taking a look and understanding about biomechanics. And uh, I met this guy, Chuck Wolf. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of him. Human Motion Associates uh, does a lot with biomechanics. And we were working uh, in the same facility and I had a baseball player with some shoulder pain, posterior shoulder pain. And I went to Chuck after working with him for a while. I said, look, I do some manual therapy on this guy. I get him right. I'm doing all the exercises, the IT wise. I'm strengthening the rotator cuff, rhomboids, all the things that we're supposed to be doing. And he goes, all right, well, you know, what's, well, what's happening into his left glute and left foot? And I go, well, why should I care? I'm just dealing with right shoulder pain. What difference does it make to me? And he goes, well, if your left first ray is not getting down onto the ground, well, then your uh, calcaneus isn't everting, your tibia is not going into internal rotation, which means the femur is not going into internal rotation. So your left hip is not going to load and you're not going to get a good eccentric load into that glute. And he's probably not getting the internal rotation that he needs into that left hip to be able to slow the eccentric load as he comes through. So if you guys followed me at all throughout that whole thing there, basically he's saying the left hip is key in being able to slow down the shoulder as you think of that baseball player coming through and it just hit me at that point and i go that's that's absolutely incredible yes i have to look at this entire kinetic chain throughout this whole pattern and sure enough as i assessed internal rotation on his left versus right hip uh, significantly lower on his left side started working and getting into his left glute, allowing that to be able to open up much better and have a better eccentric load. And sure enough, we fixed the root cause of the right shoulder pain, posterior pain there. And that's when things really started to open up for me. And even though that was introduced throughout my degrees, it wasn't in that same depth. We'd take a look at, look at the a joint or two above or below, muscle groups above or below. Uh, but taking a look at the main movements of the body and really integrating exercises to reinforce that wasn't commonly done. Um, 
and I, I've got all sorts of theories on it, and I'm sure it's all still being tested. Uh, one being a lot of the times in science, uh, when you have that that variable, you can only have one of them. And when you're trying to test it, so it's quite hard with the numerous amount of variables that are happening within the body when you're talking about everything moving. Uh, so that was something that really opened up my eyes and it caused me to start traveling the world. I wanted to understand and see other practitioners out there. I wanted to learn from everybody. I just had this huge fascination to get into more integrated exercises and movements, uh, primarily to prevent pain, to get people out of pain. Uh, but I was also looking at giving people biomechanical advantages. So when I think of strength or power or performance training, I go, how efficiently can I allow somebody to move? And once I've put them in the best biomechanical advantage to be able to do the movement that they need, how can I reinforce that under a load and under tension? And a lot of the times, I mean, you've got your squats, deadlifts, and your, your traditional exercises, but a, those don't always translate the same way to multi-planar movements that we see throughout sport and everyday life. Uh, and it's a piece of the puzzle. And that's what I started to really wanting to dive into a bit more is how the right side of the body works with the left side as you cross over. Uh, so contralateral reciprocation or just how the body reciprocates back and forth. And um, that's when I really started to discover, well, okay, maybe for me, the primary exercise that I, I believe I was taught for most, most sports performance training was the, the squat. That's almost our foundation of strength training. And I go, all right, well, what's our most fundamental human movement that we do? Well, it's not squatting. We do squat quite often, but we walk. And how do we walk? Okay, well, that's that arm swing back and forth. That's the right leg goes forward, left arm. So we've got these things working together. So maybe I should take a look at some exercises that help reinforce a bit more on the gait pattern that mimic gait running and how the body connects. And uh, that's just took me, I'd say down a rabbit hole and studying all sorts of things of movement. And that, that got me over to Australia uh, where I worked with a clinician, Ian O'Dwyer. And very interesting, interesting guy. He was a horse breaker originally. And so he worked a lot on fascia. Uh, and this was one of my bigger introductions to the fascial system and myofascia and how things connect and integrate. And he said, Brantley, when you're working with horses, you have to ask them to move. You can't tell them what to do. Because if you try to get them to move in a specific position, well, they're just going to pull back and, and not go. So that's how I take a look at training people as well. I ask their bodies to move into different positions. If I don't see what I like, I regress it and bring them back until I see that fluidity, that rhythm and timing that I'm looking for. And I, I thought that was really a beautiful way of taking a look at getting the bodies to move well. And he really focused on if you have shoulder pain, and I'm just giving an example here, I don't want to move the shoulder right away and start picking up the arm. I want to see if I can get the shoulder to move by having all of the other muscles and body parts in the body to move that shoulder throughout a range of motion. I just want to give it some rhythm and timing. And if I can give it a little range of motion without it having to contract and guard, then the neurological system is going to say, okay, I can start to allow these things to move throughout this range. I can take a weight. I can begin to swing back and forth to add a bit more of a load to it. And I'm slowly contracting these muscles at the same time, integrating it back into a system to where the shoulder doesn't have to move on an island anymore in isolation, but it can move in integration with the thoracic spine, the rib cage, then the hips, then the feet. And it, it really floored me because I, I saw what he was doing with his clients and the changes that he would make. And it, it took me for a loop. Uh, it, I spent a year working with him and it took me a solid six months to change my mindset well enough to be able to start thinking more in that manner and, and zoom back out a bit. Uh, and that was something that I was, I was constantly taught to do was to zoom in a lot, figure out exactly what's going on, assess it, and then here's what we need to do. And being able to take a step back was tremendous. Um, and the next thing that he had told me was, well, he was a plumber. 
and he said, look, the body is about 70% water. And when certain muscles, tendons, and ligaments aren't getting in blood flow, vitamins, and nutrients, and the inflammation and the toxins aren't leaving, there's a blockage somewhere. This is plumbing. And I was like, all right, I like that. So what he really took a look at was saying, can we get things moving fluidly, watch and observe? And so we do a ton of gait analysis. We'd have people move into just various positions three-dimensionally and see which muscles and parts of the body are opening up and coming back together. And you look for this pumping effect. And many of you see that now. We see it in athletes all the time. You see somebody with a limp, you go, oh, something's off. And then, well, what is that? You can dive in a little bit deeper and figure out what's going on. Uh, but taking a look, and sorry if you guys keep hearing this pinging. Uh, my wife is desperately trying to get a hold of me, but she'll be all right. Nothing too serious. Um, so with that, allowing things to move fluidly. So that's what I really gathered and took from him uh, in my practice was saying, can I get some rhythm and timing going through the body and I typically mostly work with people who are injured or dealing with aches and pains or compression. And so this is a lot of where I was focusing on with those athletes. And I started seeing people come back faster than the things that I was doing before in sports medicine. Uh, not that I was getting rid of what I do in sports medicine. I always just had it as another piece of the puzzle and could add it in as needed because there's always a time for isolation. And it was, it, it, completely evolved my practice. And so I started taking a look and saying, well, can I do this just to train athletes in general? Uh, would this help with injury prevention, um, rhythm and timing? Can I help athletes be more efficient? Can I get them into a better biomechanical advantage position and then train that more into a load and to what we think more is strength training. Uh, and, and that really took me to where we are now at new dimensions. Uh, and we still assess people. We take a look at watching them walk, watching them move, uh, figuring out what parts of their body don't have that rhythm and timing and they don't have that fluidity. We start moving them into those different positions to first create space, um, then teach them how to move within that space. And then we want to reinforce it. And a lot of what we do has to do with swinging and different movements. Uh, so I know coach wanted me to get uh, at least some sort of visual so you guys can see what I'm talking about here. So uh, a little older video, but it was of me working out a few years ago. So uh, if you guys, can you guys see my screen or how does, do I need to do something special to, to make that work? And then I can switch it over. You just click on the share screen and then uh, anything you see, we can see. Okay. In the share screen, right next that... to right next to where the leave where it says leave, there's that little share button right there. Hold on. Just up real quick, top, I know some right. people some people from other campus they have uh, to leave in a, in a minute. But if you want, you can write your questions in the chat, and then I'll ask them, and then we record because this is the recording, and we give you the record right, Jeff, later. All right, so I'm just so I see the raised hand. I've got a show conversation, show participants, and I got to hang up. Um, open share tray, mute, and a turn off camera. It's really all I'm seeing. Yeah, Mohammed, just uh, turn off your mic, please. Good evening, good afternoon, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry, guys. I'm not seeing the uh, the share. I can just see a show participants, show no. conversation. Raise yeah, no, you said it's a video, right? It's a video. You can just sh share the link in the video, and I'll share it on the uh, chat. Not, yeah, uh, it's it's just one on my computer. Oh, yeah. All right. I just pulled it up, but and it's one of those. What I, I I'd encourage you guys to to do. Um, Wait, is, I think it's it, yeah, yeah. No, it's. Who's that, Jeff? It's all right. Um, what I'll do is you guys can take a look at, uh, if you go into IndieWellness.com, and maybe, Coach, if you do that, actually, you yeah. can see a little bit. Uh, yeah. and, and that would allow us, to, there's a video that just pops up on our website, and it can show a little bit of these exercises. Um, not exactly what we were going for, but hey, we'll make it work. And um, 
as I was mentioning, a lot of this is, is designed to have the entire body move within integration uh, and functionality to improve your efficiency of movement. And um, one example that I constantly give people, if you put yourself into an anteriorly tip, uh, hip, hip position where you just push your butt back and uh, you're sticking your butt back behind you and you try to squeeze your glutes together, it's quite hard to do. Uh, but if you tuck your hips underneath you into a posterior hip rotation, pushing them forward, it's very easy to squeeze your cheeks together. You think about if somebody was getting ready to poke you in the butt, your hips go forward and they squeeze. Well, there's no, you're not making anybody stronger within that point by lifting weights and actually having hypertrophy and you know getting the true strength gain. But what you are doing is giving someone a biomechanical advantage in order to contract better. So what we'll take a look at when I'm working with different athletes is how can I get them into that right position to give them the biomechanical advantage that they need one to prevent injury, but two to produce more power and strength and then put that under load and tension. And, um, I always want to do that in an integrated fashion. And that's where a lot of these exercises that come from, uh, I haven't created all of them by any means. There's a number of clinicians around the world, uh, that are constantly evolving and adapting, uh, different bits and just seeing what more we can connect throughout the body. Um, so that's that's pretty much what I had for you all. Um, uh, if there's any questions specifically, yeah, I'd yes. be happy to, to share anything more. I know it's a lot, and uh, sometimes with a visual, it helps a little bit too, as you see some of this. But uh, yeah, if there's any questions, I've got a few minutes, Coach. I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, them. yeah, let's start with Brantley, guys. If you have any questions, please uh, throw to Brantley. I see Dalton's there too, Professor German. Um, yes. Anybody, if you don't, if you want to still formulate or put in the chat, uh, can I, can yeah, I make a question? <laughs> yeah. no, it's very interesting. Thank you for the, for sharing where, sure. so I know that you're going now. So where can we find more information about it? If you could share somewhere, because very interesting, it would be good to, to read about it. Certainly. Certainly. I, I definitely tell you, uh, jump on any one of our social media sites. Um, now to pre-warn all of you, uh, we say a lot of things on our social media to trigger. Uh, so just, you know, be uh, be mindful of that. And the goal is to get people's attention and then talk about what we're doing and why. So before too many of you get too upset uh, from what we say on there, jump on in and take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but that Type would be it in. The... put in the chat, put in the chat, Brantley, please. Um, the, 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 the information and then later, if you guys want, I can share with you guys. Also, and then also going to get the uh, Guilherme's presentation and Team's presentation, and I can share with the our staff so they can send it to the students. Good. Um, so I have a question for you, Brentley, before you go. So when you get a new student, a new client, you mm -hmm. start with the movement analysis. So then, so that's kind of like, what's the procedure where you do it? First thing yeah. you do. Yes, that's the, that's the best way to go about doing it. So with everything there always should be some sort of evaluation and then you need to test and retest uh, to make sure that we're making you know different changes uh, and, and in a positive light uh, but a lot of what i want to do i base my evaluation primarily off the gait cycle so when i take a look at how our bodies evolved uh, evolutionary speaking uh, they evolved due to function and our muscles evolved to do some sort of function and and that being walking running uh, throwing, fighting, all of these different integrated exercises together. So I start with the gait analysis. Once I have a good understanding of how somebody is moving or how they aren't moving, uh, how, where their body is holding the tension, where they're uh, stabilized, overly stabilized, and where they're quite mobilized in, then I can develop a specific program to address those areas. And as I address those areas, my goal is to get the body retensioned and balanced back uh, as, as best as possible. And then you need to reinforce those patterns and the body is always going to choose that path of least resistance. And it will truly start getting away from deficiencies when you teach it to be more efficient. Uh, so that was also something big that I, I started focusing on more is more efficient movement and efficient exercise versus always just constantly trying to address the deficiencies. And, and that's, I think that's a bit more of when I was in school and what I was taught more is find those deficiencies and address them versus just teach people to move better and load it. Uh, and, and so we do that first when someone comes in and then it's a specific plan to them. 
uh, from there, we can get into all sorts of programming um, as they move through our our uh, our program of here's our I don't even say our main lifts, but here's our key focuses. A lot of what I'm looking at is patterns in the body going, okay, I'm going to work on opening up the anterior line, the lateral line, the posterior line, the anterior X, how the right shoulder goes down to the left and vice versa on the anterior aspect and the posterior aspect. And I'm going to observe on how well someone can move bilaterally uh, with those. And we also do everything barefoot, uh, which is quite different for a number of people. Uh, we believe, and, and all of you guys know it, if you drive on your first ray, what that does to your knee and hip and even T-spawn. Uh, so you can't cheat barefoot. Uh, you can cheat in a shoe a bit. So once you go and put somebody in a shoe or a cleat, well, now that movement pattern knows what to do and it's actually moving within the shoe. Uh, so that's, I would say that's what we do primarily for people who first walk in. Nice. Great. Thank you. And then uh, one more thing, guys, when we go on the field trip, it's so fun because all the shooters, they need to take their shoes and then all they start to realize, you know, moving and then and then um, Brantley and his um, partner, Justin, they teach all those movement analysis and then it's very, very cool. So definitely check it out. And then the lights, they work with uh, radiation. What's the lights that you use? Um, In infrared lights. So infrared. Uh, yeah, one of our big philosophies is uh yeah one of our big philosophies you when you have a disease or a dis-ease within your body uh when you have aches or pains you're not thinking clearly you're having difficult sleeping your body's only made up of billions and billions of cells so those cells are either getting too much of what they don't need or not enough of what they do need and so we'll address the structural aspect which is primarily movement based but then the biochemical aspect is uh, anything that goes in or on your body. So this is your nutrition, the lights that you're exposed to. And that's where the red light or infrared light comes into play, which is a ray from the sun, uh, lotions, deodorants, uh, the food that you're eating, all the sorts of crap that goes in it nowadays, and then some organic and clean. And, uh, that's what we'll really be taking a look at is can we balance back out the body to allow it to function extremely well? Uh, and then the third part is the mental emotional side. Uh, if you think about somebody who's happy, what their posture looks like versus someone who's sad. So all three of those go hand in hand. So when we're addressing people, whether it's training or physical therapy oriented, we want to address all three of those areas. So, you know, we can get 100% versus just 33. Perfect. Okay, guys. So Bradley, I know you got to go. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for joining. Yes. And um and then we're going to move now to uh, any questions to Tim or Guilherme. Appreciate you guys Thank having me. Have a good day. Bye, guys. If anybody has a question, uh, sorry, show late, leave early. Okay, yeah, Dalton, I know. Uh, we'll be in touch. Dalton was, uh, so remember, we're going to be recording this as well. So everybody can, can watch later and we share a screen. Usually we break down in pieces and share it to the students. This is also good. Uh, any questions for Tim, guys? We, we mentioned about the social media, the networking. Um, actually, I want, just because I know that there are students on here too, and I know that there are other, you know, there's people in the same boat on this call. Just, Tim, I know we, you, before we started the meeting, you were talking about um, your progression from athletic training and how you kind of mold into like the strength and conditioning part of everything. You want to explain how you kind of morphed? <laughs> yeah, and it's really simple. Um, it, it, it partly starts with, uh, you know, I went to school for athletic training because as an athlete, I was really into it and overtraining. But it goes even further back. My dad was a high school teacher and coach, and um, I was at the field watching training and development from the time I was about five years old. I was also traveling buses, you know, several days a week from the time I was in elementary school through high school as a, you know, as an athlete in college. And then as a student trainer in college, I was continued traveling. By the time I get done with college, I was like, I love it, but not enough for the travel stuff. At that point, kind of like the exercise science, health, you know, health and, uh, you know, exercise physiology was coming out. Um, I decided to make that move. But I, I think the best development that I had was probably as an athletic, you know, training as an athletic trainer. I think it influences everything I do because my philosophy in terms of training is, you know, our, our number one goal is to keep our athletes, you know, 
um, on the I would say on the field and on the court, but Guy's on here, so we'll say in the pool as well. Um, if our athletes are, are you know are are healthy, they're going to be training every day and they're going to get better. And I think that also helps my relationships. I work really closely with our athletic trainers, um, and so that really helps us in, in that regard. But I think it was just more. Uh, I wanted to be on the other side. I think as a as a student trainer, I was seeing a lot of you know injuries in careers that were ending that didn't have to end. And it's just basically taking everything I knew after they got injured, putting it to the other side. And um, I just found that a lot more rewarding and a lot more fun. That's a good answer. Good answer. <laughs> it's a truth, it's a true answer. <laughs> nice, nice. I have a question here from one of my students. Uh, she's on Blackboard, I will share a screen on Blackboard. And then this goes uh, to Guilherme. Uh, seeing someone to work with youth, what are good books? I know you already mentioned some and articles to learn about. So you have kind of like uh, maybe name of some researchers, probably in English. And um, or what do you recommend? And then she's also working with basketball. Then later team could also help. Well, I think. If you look at the, like the technical side, right? For sure, this book, the one that I put is going to be there, right? Long term mm -hmm. athlete development. Mm -hmm. This is a good one. There are many other good books, but I think this is one little piece. I think the other piece that to work with um, with younger kids is the pedagogical side, like how to teach, how to keep the your practice structure. Right in, in our case, swimming is a group practice, right? So you have like 12, 15, 10 year old kids training, and how are you going to keep them? interested how are you going to keep them uh interested right how are you going to keep them having fun smiling all the time and how you're going to make them learn what you want to teach them i think this is the even more killer here you're going to know what to teach yeah now how to teach you're going to learn on the practice asking people and probably in some like pedagogical yeah pedagogical yeah. sciences book which I don't really know a book. Yeah, because in, in America, but it's, it's something that, for example, I will do now, right? I, I coordinate my team. So we're going to do now in August, for example, I'm going to bring the, the head of the lower school, which is up to 11 year old, right? Six to 11, five to 11. She will well, give our coaches a professional development on this side. So like how to teach, how to keep the practice structure, how to keep them interested. Uh, usually I have a, Interesting thing, I always keep this in mind. Sometimes, you know, if a coach is not is sick or whatever, coach cannot make it, I go there and, and substitute for them, right? So I'm gonna go and go and coach the 10 year old kids. And I always remember this phrase, the amount of seconds you have to explain what they have to do is their age. So if they're eight year old, you have eight seconds to explain what they have to do. If you take more than this, forget it. They're gonna start jumping, playing, they're good, they're and they're not gonna understand. And it's really true. Of course, not exactly right. It can be 10 seconds, not eight, but that means you have to be quick. You cannot stay there talking about philosophy with the eight year old kids, right? So I don't have a book, sorry, but no, I know that you have one. to go, you have to go yeah. search on the pedagogical side, like how to teach. Perfect. You learn yeah. the practice, yeah. you learn yeah. watching other people. Yeah. So what I, what I used, when I was a PE teacher way back in the day, um, we always worked off of motor development books because it showed the breakdown of sequence of a, a three-year-old into what the expectation is that they go into for, you know, what, what is their throwing development going to look like? So then you can monitor, you know, you can look at that. What's their kicking development? What's their, you know, then, then their throwing development. And then eventually that carries over to your bat and ball sports and swimming and, and, and everything that relates to racket sports. So those are books that I always went to. And then to help with the coaching part of everything, I always went, I, this is a book from 1995. It's called Quicksilver. Um, and one of the things we, I did with this was it's a lot of like team, like team play, um, trust building activities, um, kind of like team building. So it's not, it's not so much that, it, you know, cause one of the things that, you know, I remember as, you know, as we went through coaching development and everything in, in school was that the main thing that you want to focus on is, yeah, you're always worried about the 
sports specific side of everything. But at the end of practice or at some point, maybe on a Saturday morning, you pull them in and you do team building things because now they have to be able to trust each other. They have to be able to work together and it may not even relate to any sport that you're playing. And sometimes they need that mentally. And then all they do is that carries it over, you know, in, onto your relays, onto your courts, onto your rinks, on, you know, wherever you're playing. So that's kind of the things that I worked a lot with. Nice. Thanks. Okay. Uh, guys, before we finish, I always do this. Jeff knows going to ask team first to give you like a little statement, like, like, a, like a sentence, inspirational final moments here for the students. Nothing like being under the gun. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, the, I think just, you know, some of the stuff I put in there, I'll, I'll just, I'll just sum it up. That is, uh, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, it's as coaches or people interact, our integrity is is super important. So always remember that. Um, and you know, again, and I think that you know, no one cares so much you know until you know how much you care. And I think that goes a long way with everything we're doing. Perfect, you let me. All right. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're gonna be a little bit of my surprise too. But I think that the last mm -hmm. question was really good, right? I was thinking here. That's really true, right? We are talking about what to teach, but how to is a very important thing. And uh, I think we have to always remember we are be beyond everything. We are educators, right? We will educate the people no matter the age they are. We're gonna be giving, bringing something to them, and we need to keep this in mind. Something like we try here in our team to to do is like always help each other always serve each other right uh, for the kids to to learn how to do it i didn't i wanted to put in the presentation but say it's going to be too long it's going to be already so now getting the chance to talk about it we always keep try to teach the kids the identity as a team that serve each other a team that never complains and a team that values work that's how we put and i think this summarize uh a very important part of education, right? You're not studying for you, you're not working for you, but to do good for others. Yes. And this is a huge part of, of the education. We try always to emphasize this on the team. You know, it, it takes a long time for them to learn, but when they do, it's a beautiful thing. So I'm way beyond swimming fast or winning things, right? Perfect. So I think this is one thing I wanted to leave. Thank you. And then the boss, Jeff, final. <laughs> so, no. So, actually, the one thing that I, the takeaway that I have a different one today than I normally would before, but Brantley said something to me that made it spin is that, you know, you go to school, you learn all the nuts and bolts of everything. But what ends up happening, and I know Tim and Guillerme, I know you both can can attest to this, is that you learn it, and then your your on the job application is what takes you to that next level. You know, we can get everything we can in school, but you can you can apply it only to an extent until you start developing your your habits, your your day to day operations, and I think that that really comes into play so that. We can guide you so far as instructors, but it's going to be your mentors and you, as everybody on here has said today, that you have to do your own research. You have to you have to develop your own traits. You have to be able to find your style that fits and it has to fit with your team. So that's kind of my, you know, I, I can, Stefan can, you know, uh, who else? Bill is on the call. I see uh, Dr. Boche, Ashley, Sharla. You guys are all here. You all know we all we teach it. But, you know, I, I love those stories that I get, you know, oh, when I remember you taught me that during this class, I'm using that now. And it's like, yeah, but I know you're using it in a different way. So, <laughs> yeah, I would just say you know, at the end of the day, I think we can sum it all up. Is that we're trying to create lifelong learners. And if we can do that, I think that we've hit the mark. Right. Nice. Thank you, guys. I think no, was thanks. Very thank you, day. everybody. Appreciate it. We send you the the recording later, and then uh, Jeff, uh, if you can uh, send it to me. Remember, I'm gonna ask uh, Kaiser people to put on their uh, YouTube official YouTube as well. So I think it was nice. Thank you all the okay. program directors, all the staff, boss, program, German. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. So very cool. Now, thank you guys all for right, showing up. All. I know you guys are busy, so. Bye-bye. All right, thank you.